Someone has to be different. <laughs> but you know, it's good to weather this morning or afternoon. It's a privilege to be in the house of God. Amen. Because when you think of what you have gone through this week, for some of us, it has been very trying. It has been difficult. But when we come to the house of God, we are able to relax and rest from all the problems that we have had. And I pray that we will do so today. In order for us to understand what my sermon is about, I'd like us to take our Bibles and turn to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to read verses 1 to 13. It's a familiar text, our passage of scripture. It is one that everyone knows about. We've heard it many, many, many times. So there's nothing new about it. I've well got it, Matthew chapter 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said, said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye out, or but go out ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for I know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The topic of my sermon today is, go away, I don't know you. I was going to say it in Patfor. <laughs> but when I was practicing at home, it didn't come out right. <laughs> Been away too long. <laughs> I was practicing, but it just wouldn't come out right. And I thought, no, I didn't want everybody to crack up laughing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you know, but that is something that I wouldn't want anyone to say to me. But before we go into the sermon, let's bow our heads for a few moments. Loving Father, we thank you for your words. As we come to see what it is you have got for us, I'm asking that you will remove all obstacles from our minds, whatever preconceived ideas we may have, 
and help us to see you and to see what is your desire for us as individuals. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Go away. I don't know you. I heard you, man. I'm not going to attempt it. I'm not that brave. <laughs> but go away. I don't know you. I remember many years ago in the one of the congregations where I was, a brother was getting married and he asked another brother to be his best man. The brother said, I can't be your best man because I don't know you. The thing about this is that the one that was getting married at a house and the person that he asked to be his best man has been a lodger in his house for at least five years. So the landlord told he knew the brother. They went to the same church. They studied together. He told he knew him well enough to ask him to be his best man. But instead the brother said, I can't because I don't know you. The brother, of course, was upset. He was very upset when the brother refused or rejected his invitation. And I have to question how many of us have been rejected in our lifetime? I know as young people Clarence Dunn our Tennessee. We, at your club we used to play this game, if I lose, if I lose, I don't care. How oh, many of us know it? Oh, yeah. oh, oh yeah, Sharon, you know it too. And my sister here. You know, and think of the game, it was a game for us. The girls would go to a ball with in two lines and the girls would approach a young man and if he wants to, you know, to accept her offer, he would take her place in her line. If he didn't, he would turn his back. And it, the game goes on and when it was, to, you know, and I remember it was a game, but I didn't, we didn't feel anything. As a matter of fact, it was fun if they turned their back and refused and let to walk back to where you were. You know, but as we get older, <coughs> we become more sensitive to rejection. When you applied for a job, you do all that you can. You make sure that your CV or the application form is filled in to the best of your ability. You make sure you write all the right words so that your application will be accepted only to receive a letter. Sorry you weren't successful. And we hear of people right, sending out applications, at least two, three, four, five applications per week. And they wait a long time before they are able to get a letter to say, good, well, you can, you've got the job. 
Some people do not know how to deal with rejection. And this is one rejection I'm telling you, brethren, I wouldn't want to receive. I wouldn't want at the end of the day, I hear the words, go away. I don't know you. Let's go back a bit. Christ began to tell about these incidents back in Matthew 24. When the disciples asked him a question, look here, what is the sign? How oh, will we know when you are coming? Not only us, but through the ages, how oh, will people know when you are coming? Help us to understand. Give us something. You know, but in those days, people wanted to know what is going to happen. And so they have to tell us what is going to happen. And in Matthew 24, I'm just running through that quickly, quickly. You know, he tells us, look here, this is what it's going to be like in society. There's going to be war, there's going to be fighting, there's going to be all sorts of things taking place in society. Not only will there be commotion, not only will there be confusion, but he also said, for you who have accepted me, you're going to experience difficulties. You will not be able to worship the way that you worship then, or uh, in our context now. We will not be able to come to <coughs> church. You will find that there will be people in sitting among us who are spies. Who, when they get the opportunity, they will go to the authority and say, hey, he's a son of or she's a son of And by the way, that's where they're worshipping and pursuing. People who will have the opportunity to do those sort of things, they will have no allegiance, they will have no feeling whatsoever. It will be a natural thing. For them to do. So it tells us the condition in society. <coughs> people, you're wondering why you're having problems getting people to accept Christ. The scripture tells us that the love of many will go cold. They will have no desire whatsoever. So Christ begin to explain to us in Matthew 24 the condition of society, the condition of people in the world. And it's not a good picture, it's not a pity picture that he painted. So moving away from that, we come to chapter 25, where he begins to focus on those of us in the church, those of us who have claimed that we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal saviour. We thought we had escaped it. We thought, well, you know, I'm the chosen one. I'm the one who holds up the banner and waves it. thinking we're safe. But in Matthew 25, Christ gave three illustrations 
to show the condition of you and me, what we are like. And it's not a pretty picture. So if you and I are feeling comfortable thinking, yes, I give Bible study ten times a week, I fast ten times a week, I whatever, whatever, you know, I pay the, the biggest amount of tithes and offering in any congregation, forget it. Forget it, brother. Because Christ tells us our condition in Matthew 25. The first illustration he gave is about the virgins. And he said five are 50-50. 50% were wise, 50% did not have that interest. That's frightening. So how do we set which out of which one are you on? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as part of the fifty percent that were wise? Or do you see yourself as part of the fifty percent who are foolish? Where do you stand? Where do I stand at this moment? If Christ should come now, which side of the fence would I be on? Where would I be? I think these are questions you and I need to ask ourselves. The next, the next bit that he did was about the talents. And we're looking at verse 14 to 30, where he gave five and two and one. Again, that's representing you and I. To what extent that we use our talents. To what extent are we working for the Lord? To what extent are we showing what God has done for us and what God can do for others? And the final illustration he gave about the church can be found in verses 31 to 46. The sheep and the goat. But we're coming to that in a moment. Because Christ has revealed some things that will help us to recalculate what we are doing in today's society. But anyway, we can see that when the foolish, you know, let's move to the point where they fell asleep. And all of them, according to the scripture, all of them fell asleep. So at that point, there will be a time when there will be this inactivity, when no one will be doing anything. It doesn't matter how much Brother Scarlett or Pastor comes up and say, Brethren, or uh, Jackie in the PM department comes up and says, Brethren, let's go out and witness, let's go out and do this, let's go out and do that. There will come a time when nobody will listen. Nobody will want to do anything. 
because everyone will be sleeping. Sleep will be much sweeter than anything else, than going out and talk about Christ. <clears throat> but there was a different The wise had something with them that the fools didn't. The wise had actual oil. We know from our teaching that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And therefore when the fools turn to the wise and say, hey, look it, give us some of your oil. Because the bridegroom is coming, give us some of your oil so that you know we can be there with him to you know shed our shine our light. They said, "How oh, can we give it to you?" I remember. I'm going back years now, brethren. A Pentecostal friend of mine invited me to his church. Same place in Wolverhampton. And uh, I went with him that Sunday evening. And it was the very, very first time I'd ever been to a Pentecostal church. And I had the shock of my life. They had a the speaker that was there, when he, while he was preaching, he went down and he, he said, all those who have not yet got the Holy Spirit, you are going to receive the Holy Spirit tonight. And he went around and he touched people. And to my surprise, they fell on the floor and they started to do all different types of movements. And I remember he came to me. <laughs> I'm telling you what happened. He came to me, I looked at him, <laughs> I looked at him and smiled, but even though I was smiling, the looks I gave him were to say, back off. <laughs> Don't come any further else. He looked at me and said, oh, you don't believe. I said, that's right, I don't. And he went on to the next person and touched them and they fell. You know, and they do what they had to do. That opens up a discussion between myself and my friend for many, many, many months. Was he able to give someone else the Holy Spirit by touching them? Is that the way one received the Holy Spirit? And we had a, many discussions on that incident. And I'm saying the wise could not give the Holy Spirit or their oil to the wise, to the unwise. So they had to go back to the originator. But while they were away, the scripture tells us the bridegroom came. By the time they were able to 
get what they wanted, they get themselves in the position that they ought to be, and went back to the wedding. The bridegroom was able to say to them, oh, I don't know you. This is not talking, brethren, let's get it clear. This is not talking about people out there who wants to come. It is talking about you and me. Who are sitting down waiting for Christ to come. Right, let's be clear. It's not talking about outsiders. And Christian is talking about those of us who have professed to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. He went on to tell us about those with the talents from verse 14 to 30. I'm not going to too much into this, but how the five talents and the two talent person they do what they had to do. But the one talent person becomes complacent. As many of us might find ourselves in that situation now. We become complacent. We depend on others to do what we should be doing to. We leave it for others to do. And we pack ourselves on the back to make ourselves feel good. Because, you know, we're faithful simply thinkers. We come to church on the Sabbath. We hold positions in the church. We can come on the platform and we can talk and, you know, we can do all sorts of things. But yet at the same time, the talent God gave to us, we're not utilizing it. The ability is given to us, we're not utilizing it. And as we see what happens, and I like this particular one, from verse 31 to 46, when he talks about the sheep and the goat, he's still talking about us, but he's using different uh, illustrations to help us to realize what we are, what conditions we're in. And it tells us that there will be two sets, the 50-50 the sheep and the goats. And just look and this a bit. He says, verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hunger, and ye gave me meat, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And so Christ began to show the areas that we are lacking. He didn't, strangely enough, he didn't say, you didn't know about the 2,300 days prophecy. He didn't say, you didn't know about the mark of the beast. He didn't say a lot of other things. He did not mention about our doctrines. 
He didn't say because you did not this, you did not that. He said, look here, I'm not, I want us to realize because your actions were not reflecting the work that I came and I gave you to do. That is what I'm pointing out to you. So the sheep, they said, but hold on. When were you ever in that situation? When was it that you've ever been hungry or naked or sick or in prison, you know, for us to do that for you? It has us as much as you have done it to whom? So what I'm saying to us, we need to begin to balance ourselves. We cannot just be one-sided. You know, we cannot be like the priests and the Levites. In the story of the Good Samaritan, who taught, look here, I'm going to contaminate myself. We need to start looking broadly. Not just telling each other about doctrine or stand what we must believe in, what we must do, etc., etc. But we also need to open our mind and our understanding and see what the needs in our community are also. We need to do that, because if we don't do that, we will be no good to the community that we say that we are out to help. There's no need we're talking to the community, and yet when we see their need, we close a blind eye. You know, and pass by, brethren. We need to balance ourselves up. I must make it clear right now. I haven't got a problem with the doctrines of our church. I haven't got a problem with someone preaching on it. I preach it too. But I also feel that we need to look out for people in the community. We looked at Abraham as the first missionary. And we could see in his life how dedicated he has been to God. And whatever God asked, whatever God asked him to do, he did it. And a member of my class pointed out that he never murmured. He never refused God. Whatever God asked him to do, he did it. But at the same time, whenever there is injustice, when his nephew Lot was taken, he did not hesitate. He went and he rescued him. How about us? If our brethren is in difficulty, do we have that mindset, brethren, to say, Ed, hey, I'm going to rescue that person from whatever situation they're in? How do we sit back and say, hmm, and get themselves in it, and get out of it themselves? 
Do we offer prayers for them? Do we feel that we are part of their life? Do we feel that we have got a responsibility to help them? This is to help us to see how far we may have drifted away from the common humanity. We don't want to lose that. We don't want to get too caught up into the do's and don'ts and forget that there are people out there that you and I need to demonstrate to them what God is like. Christ came and he showed us what he ought to do. Yes, he preached, he taught, but the scripture also keep has given us enough evidence that he also demonstrated to us how we should treat not only brethren but how we should treat outsiders. We must do good and it's a matter of us having that balance. That's all we need to get that balance so that when Christ comes, 50% got it right. So when Christ came, he, he will be able to say to them, hey, come. You have been doing what I wanted you to do. You have used your talent. You have used it to win souls for me. You have gone out there and you have seen people who need help. Who did not have anyone to visit them in hospital? Who did not have anyone to visit them in prison to say a kind word for them? They may have been feeling at their lowest. They may feel they were the worst criminal in society. I remember, brethren, when I was doing social work, this woman, this is the last illustration I'm giving, this woman, I think I may have said it before, I wrote the letter to her to say when I will be visiting her. And two days before, when I went in the office, I was told that this person had ran to say they've got an appointment. They cannot see me. We gave her another appointment. Again, a day or two before I went, she ran to say, sorry, I won't be here. I thought to myself, I'm not going to be caught out this time. So I didn't write her to say, okay, I'll come and see you another time. I kept that appointment. I went round that afternoon, rang her bell. She told the secretary she wouldn't be in. So I went, I didn't expect her to begin. She answered. I introduced myself, who I've never met before. I introduced myself and she was surprised that I had the nerve to turn up at her house when she said she wouldn't be in. And I asked her if I could come in and she let me in and I didn't ask her any question, why did you phone up to say you wouldn't be in? I didn't ask her because I knew she had problems. I knew she was hiding. 
she, she had lost her confidence in herself. And I didn't ask her any questions apart from, how are you? How has things been? And that woman, she began to open up. And she told me when she was 16, she got pregnant. Because her family were Catholic, they felt it was a disgrace in the family. They went back to the Caribbean, they left her here in England because they didn't want anything to do with her. She had a hard time. And she felt the worst part about it, brethren, because her family had rejected her, she also felt that God had rejected her too. And she didn't want anything to do with God, the church, or anything. I spent about an hour and a half with her. And I know I didn't suppose to, but I had to quote scriptures to her for her to realize that God loves her more than she can ever imagine. And that God is not the one who have rejected her, but she have turned her back on God. You know, and as we talk, I begin to see a beam of light, you know, in her face. And I said to her, can I see you again next week? And I will talk with you properly on what we can provide for you. She said yes. And I went back. And you know, brethren, I couldn't believe it was the same woman I'd seen previously. Because, you know, that release, she said to me, Mr. Griffith, I went to church on Sunday for the first time in 10 years. You know, and I felt good about it. Because I was able to help her to see what God is like. Cut a long story short, she was able to pick herself up. I encouraged her to go to college. She went to college, went on to uni. She trained to be a teacher. And to my knowledge, she's still teaching to this day. Amen. You know, so when Christ is saying, look here, when I was hungry, when I was this, when I was that, we need to start visiting people. We need to start doing things for them. Because we do not know where it will lead. You know, when you go into their home, when you know, you don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to have, a, you know, Scripture beaming out of your ears and your eyes and your mouth. Go there as a natural human being with love in your heart. And once people are able to see that, I'm telling you, brethren, you will be able to pull them through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when we go to people with our own set agenda, we do more harm, we messed up their mind, we messed up their understanding of God and the church. We turn them off God and the church more than we pulling them in. So let us, you know, take heed. 
Let us decide for ourselves, look here, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. But I'm going to do it God's way. I pray, brethren, that as we go through, I'm finishing now, as we go through this coming week, that we will find somebody who we may not have seen. We may not have seen them for some time. It could be our neighbour. It could be church brethren. Let us make that decision. I'm going to visit them. I was away on holiday for one week. I didn't tell one of my neighbour that I would have been away. And on the Saturday, when she saw that my car was still there, it hadn't gone because she now used my car to church. She was going to phone the police, she said, just in case I was sick. She was going to phone the police for them to break the door down. Luckily, she said she spoke to the neighbour above her and he told her, no, it's okay, it's gone on holiday. That's the sort of concern that we should be displaying, brethren. When we do not see one another, when we don't see our neighbour, when we don't see a family member, I pray that as we go through, and as we read Matthew 25 for ourselves, that we will have new meaning. And do likewise. God bless you.